Uh, tell me a little bit about writing the book, first of all. I mean, you're, 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 you're a best-selling author to begin with, but, uh, but the gene, an intimate history, um, is really written for the layman, isn't it? It is. It is it's written for everyone. It begins with the story of my family, and from there pans out towards, you know, um, Gregor Mendel, the isolated monk working with peas and trying to find out why traits are passed in, across from one animal to another, one plant to another. It goes through the horrors of Nazi eugenics, American eugenics, um, tells the story of the discovery of DNA with all its rivalries and, and, and ugliness, um, and also the fascination, the beautiful science. And then um, that's the first part of the book. The second part of the book is about sort of the broad ethical challenges that we face as we learn to read and write the human genome. But the, but the centerpiece of all of this is that we need as a public to understand and to speak the knowledge of genes. We need to understand the words. Um, I sometimes say that, you know, talking about, uh, you can't talk about the physical world, the material world, without talking about atoms. You can't play music without knowing what a note is. In the same way, you can't talk about anything biological without knowing what genes are. Genes are the central pieces of information that drive our understanding of the biological world. I mean, you know, we're, we don't cover this in the documentary because it was finished before, but right now, a piece of genetic material wrapped in a coat has upended the world economy. Um, we need, in order, you know, how we track this virus, how we uh, make uh, proteins against the virus, how we make vaccines, are all dependent on the last century or so of our understanding of genes. You cannot, we would be armless against COVID-19 without our understanding of genetics. It, it, to me, it's an amazing thing because, you know, for o over 150 years, uh, you know, the science has been around, uh, you know, talking about genes. And even uh, in fiction, when, when you read H.G. Wells and you know, about the War of the Worlds, the thing that killed the Martians was a small virus. My, my long question gets to, is there going to be a time where we can just weed out, you know, uh, uh, this type of thing genetically? Can we be genetically modified to withstand disease? Well, I mean, diseases come in so many forms, uh, from ranging from viral illnesses to heart attacks to mental illness. Um, and diseases are almost a consequence, almost always a consequence of the environment, the host, and you know, the organism. If it's a if it's a microbe, um, I don't think we'll weed out diseases uh, completely from from human beings. I don't think that's ever going to be possible. Human beings are always going to be uh, susceptible, vulnerable. But I do think that the creation of medicines, the creation of vaccines uh, will have and already has had extraordinary impact. I mean, you know, in the 17th century, in the 18th century, a smallpox pandemic could kill people in, you know, droves and droves of people. And, and, and uh, a vaccine against that was uh, changed the world. A vaccine against polio changed the world. So. Um, we have many, many, many ways of tackling diseases. And if it's viral diseases or bacterial diseases that we're talking about, then, of course, the use of genetic techniques to understand them, to dissect them, to dissect their patterns of spread, and to understand how to stop them using medicines and vaccines is of crucial importance. I think this will be, this is one example of many pandemics that will hit us. Um, more are yeah. coming. Uh, our preparedness depends, of course, on uh, medicine, it depends on politics, it depends on politicians, but it also depends on our understanding of genetics. Why do you think people are scared of vaccines? I mean, uh, is that just complete misinformation? I think virtually all of it is misinformation. Um, people are scared because they are exposing, you know, a vaccine is very different from a medicine. In a vaccine, you're exposing someone who's otherwise healthy to prevent a future disease. Um, and there have been vaccines in the past where, the, you know, which when they were tested, either didn't work or, uh, uh, you know, caused uh, 
side effects uh, and those who have been withdrawn. I mean, these go through very rigorous testing. So uh, I think some of the scare is the fact, again, that uh, that we're putting it into healthy people and, you know, we're subjecting healthy people to a disease that they don't have. So I think I think that's been one of the major sources of, of scare. Uh, working with Ken Burns, is, has, is that a joy? It's a joy beyond a joy. Ken's a brilliant mind. He's the preeminent documentarian of our times. Uh, and, and what's important about Ken is, is the width of his thinking. He doesn't think of science as, you know, things that, something that's, you know, practiced by white coats in a laboratory. He thinks of science as part of social history, part of American history, part of world history. And, and it's that strength to be able to cross disciplines, to understand, to be humble, but also to understand how to make a film about a complex topic, um, which is not the same as a book. The film and the book are very different beasts. The book is historical. It, you know, it has a different pace. The film is more emotional. It has more case studies, more individual examples of people that are followed. Um, I collaborated with Ken on cancer, um, and that was an incredible experience. And this too has been absolutely incredible. In our final seconds together, tell me a little bit about what people can do. You know, we've heard it over and over again, but uh, you know, I just read your tweet about everybody in New York should be you know, wearing masks. Uh, tell me what you think people should do to protect themselves. Well, I think the first priority clearly is to uh, protect medical personnel um, because they are on the front lines. So they need to be given everything, all the resources that they need in order to protect themselves and to be able to treat patients. There is no doubt about that. I also believe that social isolation, distancing and hand hygiene are crucial. But given all of this, I think that people should also be wearing simple masks, not N95 respirators. They need to be wearing simple masks and distancing themselves in order to protect others from their own respiratory secretions, as well as protect uh, themselves from, uh, from respiratory secretions. This is for essential workers. Others should, you know, if you are not essential, stay at home. The crucial thing is to buy us time the whole medical community to buy us time to be able to get medicine. Medicines are being made, they're coming, they're being tested. We need time to test them and we need the medical workers to be safe and, and, and to protect them in order for them to be able to test these medicines. You know, before, before I end this, uh, on a lighter note, uh, do you have a favorite pandemic movie that, <laughs> that, that you've watched? Outbreak. Ah, with uh, Dustin Hoffman, Morgan Freeman. With Dustin Hoffman wearing a face mask and a shield. There you go. Dr. Sid, thank you so much. I appreciate your time this morning and, and keep up the good work. Thank you so much.